I would say that the biggest myth is that um, toxic workplaces come from a place of people wanting to do bad things to other people. In my experience, toxic workplaces are evolved out of ignoring habits and people like just trying to survive. It's basically survival mechanisms happening. So I guess I always just say that because sometimes we think we don't have a toxic workplace and you could be cultivating one without even knowing it because it's just kind of something that naturally kind of evolves. Hey everyone, this is Devin Miller here with another episode of The Inventive Expert. I'm your host, Devin Miller, the serial entrepreneur that's grown several startups into seven and eight figure businesses, as well as the founder and CEO of Miller IP Law, where he helps startups and small businesses with their patents and trademarks. If you ever need help with yours, just go to strategymeeting.com, grab some time with us to chat, and we're always here to help. Now, today we've got another great guest on the podcast, Sam Smeltzer. And uh, Sam uh, has a background in uh, human uh, resources and uh, being a, a leader of a, a or, and we'll be talking a little bit about how to being a leader of a startup can be much different. I'm also talking a little bit about uh, learning uh, why uh, are the a leader or boss is different and how that uh, how you're understanding the differences with, you know, wasting time and money or building culture or, or why some people are just uh, not fun to work with. And then uh, talk a little bit about uh, wellness and uh, and bringing balance in the workplace and um, and also uh, maybe uh, dealing a little bit with uh, how you you might hate uh, some areas of the business, such as finance, but uh, how you have to deal with them anyway. So it should be some great areas of uh, conversation and good uh, topics. So with that much as a introduction, welcome on the podcast, Sam. Hi, thank you so much for having me here today. It's really, it's always great having a conversation with you, Devin. Absolutely. So now, so now before we jump into a, a few of the topics at hand uh, for, you know, just as a quick reminder for um, the audience, uh, Sam was on our sister podcast, The Inventive Journey. So if you want to hear Sam's full journey, definitely go and make sure to, to check out that episode. Um, but uh, if you, if for those that haven't had a chance to uh, catch that episode yet, uh, give them uh, just a, a quick introduction to you. Yeah, absolutely. So um, by trade, I am an HR practitioner, started out heavily as a generalist doing employee relations um, and then kind of got burnt out on, you know, being the terminator essentially and moved to the softer side of HR doing training and development. Um, mm -hmm. And then I kind of had like a, a purpose driven uh, crisis of, you know, in training and development and doing engagement and culture work. If I really kind of knew what I was doing and if the solutions I was proposing were actually making a difference. And that led to me starting my entrepreneurial journey using me as guinea pig number zero to figure out if I could even stay engaged in a organization that I created from the ground up. And uh, fast forward, I now own basically a, a wellness professional development center known as the Heart Center that combines HR consulting with professional development and well-being um but yeah those are the highlights and obviously on the sister podcast we went in greater depth of how that journey kind of unfolded for me but that's that's kind of where i'm at awesome no uh, great journey and uh, certainly a, a great uh, discussion so so now diving into a, a few of the topics at hand and maybe in no particular order but you know one of the things that uh, that we chatted a bit or bo a bit about was you know how the di there's uh, maybe a difference in being a leader versus a boss and you know you that includes everything from understanding you know sometimes we're wasting time and money or building the culture or being the jerk or or, or working with jerks and kind of how you balance that so give us a bit of an insight as to you know a little bit more about uh, the difference there and kind of uh, things to consider yeah you know so um, when I started my own business, I knew I always wanted to have a team because I know the power of having a team and those collaborations. Um, I will say that 2020 kind of changed that for me because with podcasting, like what we're on today, we meet people that are across the country, across the globe, like Devin and I, who have kind of stayed connected via podcasts. Um, mm -hmm. And so there's other levels of collaboration. But back when I started my business, it was pretty much the old school kind of mentality was whatever was kind of in your community. Um, and so I really dreamed about building this team and thinking that I could do it really well, because that's what I was in business for. I was an HR consultant and advisor in these big corporations, telling leaders how to build culture with their team 
teams. Um, and so, you know, it, it should be the easy part of the job. Um, I started to build my team at the same time that I was actively dealing with why I'm disengaged from my work and that I'm actively burnt out. And I very quickly started to realize why every leader and boss and CEO that I've worked with becomes very frustrated with individuals and why the tasks that I would give them are extremely challenging. And I guess I'm being very polite about it, but you know, every little thing can start to really um, work on you because it's not just people not doing work. It's people not doing work that's costing you money and the salaries that you pay people are the most expensive investment and in fact early on i felt very committed to bringing on a full-time employee so that was my first thing that i did i mean my gosh if you looked at my finances my financial statements back then i mean i basically was not really paying myself i was just covering overhead and then paying for this person who ended up not being what my organization needed at the time. And also I found out later on was being mean to some of the other employees. So totally having like this horrible culture. Um, and I I basically was overly emotional. Like I couldn't even talk to this person. So the person, you know, I'm supposed to have my, my stuff together. I'm supposed to like coach people on how to do that. And I couldn't even do it within my internal organization. And so I definitely, I don't know, helped me grow as a person because uh, I realized why that's so difficult for people now. And so it changes the way I approach things. Um, so it was very eye opening. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it, it, we read leadership books all the time and management books all the time. It's very different when you're an entrepreneur uh, than it is when you're in a large organization and just gifted with managing people. Hmm. So now walk and, and i and i couldn't agree more but you know what do you think is the the driver of that difference you know in the sense that and i it, whether or not your hr background in doing that i think that people inherently when you're not in the leadership boss position but rather you're the employee you know it's easy and i'll put it in quotes that you can identify hey here are the slackers here are the people that really should be let go here are the people that are causing contention and all those things and yet seems like more often than not when you get in the driver's seat when you are the boss when you are making the decisions and you're the leader that either you are unwilling to make those hard decisions it's harder to make those decisions or they go unnoticed more and you not you don't or pick up on that as more so how do you First of all, maybe the question is, why does that uh, often tend to occur and how do you address it as a leader so that you don't let those things uh, go unnoticed? Yeah, well, I think it goes on address because we have so much stuff to do, like your plate's so full. And I know even for me, I, I was guilty of not doing the things that I know that are best practices that I would, was actively getting on stage and and webinars and teaching about, and then I'm not actually doing them because I didn't have the time. I had other things that were pressing for clients to, to basically make the money, which is what keeps everything afloat. And then at the same time, I'm not doing the coaching or the feedback and being in HR, or if you're a leader and you have to deal with anybody in HR, or you have an attorney that you call for limiting your liability, they're going to say, Hey, have you coached this person? Have you talked to this person? Like to lower your risk, you need to have those conversations. And so sometimes we end up tolerating the smaller things that then turn into bigger things or kind of compound. And then we end up being extremely frustrated. And the hardest time to address it is when we are extremely frustrated. Um, and I will tell you that probably the biggest lesson that I've learned is that this really made me take a hard look at the significance of doing like staff planning. And when you're an entrepreneur, it's much easier because it's smaller scale. And if you can think about how intentional you are about adding positions and then really, really taking your time during the recruitment process and, and figuring all that stuff out, which this is the core of HR stuff that I, you know, I was taught back in college that was just never had to be put into practice. Now I'm putting it into practice and I'm reaping the benefits of those kinds of things. Cause honestly, you know, I'm giving examples from early on in my career. I've been in business for close to 10 years now. And for the last three years, I have a stellar team. Like it's, it's night and day. Um, and they're teaching me a whole nother slew of lessons there. But back early on, when I was doing it with these old school kind of tactics. It was, it was painful. <laughs> Absolutely. No. And I, you know, it's interesting that just uh, how that is that shift. And I agree. I think a lot of it is you could probably still on a lot of it, do a good job if you had unlimited time or un unlimited time and ability to to do that. And yet when you're juggling multiple things and you have to say, okay, 
which is a fire I have to put out today. And oftentimes those aren't the the biggest fires or the things that you tend to focus on. Not that they're not important, but just that, you know, you have a lot of things to get done. So now one of the other things that, you know, we talked about, and I think it, you know, it's interesting the the shift with each generation, kind of what they focus on as well as just the time and the, the culture and that, but it seems like there's certainly a, a shift away from, you know, if you go back a few generations as, Hey, I'm going to work for the same um, same business for the, my whole career and it, I'm going to enjoy it and, you know, work hard there to, hey, I'm going to maximize, you know, how much money I'm going to make and maybe how much, you know, esteem I get to now, hey, I want a, a balance of wellness and um, life and, you know, not just there or that my the purpose of life is not just working, not that you don't need to work and earn a living, but now looking a bit more for that work life balance. And so um, kind of, you know, as, a, as you're setting up a workplace, on the one hand, you know, as a boss or as a leader, you're looking to maximize the return you get for employees. You're paying them for a reason, which is to help grow, build and grow the business. And yet you're also having those pressures of providing that balanced workplace. So how do you go about as a boss or a leader to you kind of uh, incorporate all of those things? Yeah. Um, so my approach has been a little bit different uh, because number one, getting burned with putting a lot of money into staff and not seeing quite a bit of return. Um, when I kind of hit like, uh, COVID and quarantine kind of gave me the gift of everybody kind of departing and going in different ways. So I had this like nice little reset and then I could take my time and carefully kind of creep in and, and figure out what I wanted to do from a staffing and a culture perspective. Um, I will tell you that the first employee that I hired, it was a very like honest conversation about how I'm kind of messy as a leader because I got burned so badly and, and kind of just having the conversation that we're having now, like that I felt taken advantage of. And so this really needed to be a really good fit. And I think sometimes, number one, we're not that transparent in the hiring process. We want to like make sure we look good and vice versa. Um, and then that also opened up the window to have like a real honest conversation about pay, about like, hey, I'm still building my business. This is what I have. Is there possibly possibility that this could be a win-win? And this individual was burnt out in her place of employment. And we basically worked together to decide what the hours would look like. And she also like wanted to start focusing on painting. She had a passion for art and build that side of the business. And so we were able to kind of construct this thing that was all around the individual to create a relationship that really worked. Um, and that was an easy way to kind of start building this culture where it got complicated is when you start adding more. So tomorrow I'm adding actually two more to my team. Um, and really the framework that I'm going to say that I'm using is we've built a really solid mission and we know exactly what it looks like for somebody who wants to work with our team. And for the most part, they come on board as part time and we see ourselves as being adding to the complexities of people not finding job satisfaction somewhere. So it's almost like. I don't know, I guess my entrepreneurial brain instantly turned it into like, let's see where the other areas of opportunity there are that maybe we can see this being a win-win. So I have a bunch of other employees that are part-time employees because they don't want to have to run their own businesses on the side, but I get their talent and their expertise and their knowledge and they believe in what we do, which is the healing and growth of people matter. And they work with our organization and they're highly committed and, and it's kind of like a win-win. Um, but at the end of the day, it really took me going down to looking at every individual and understanding what their needs are and what they're thinking about. So like even right now, we're doing forecasting and sales and budgeting. And I just put out a question to everybody that I want to know what your ultimate desired annual compensation is working with my organization and whatever relationship that you have with us. So if I'm your fun money on the side, how much fun money do you want to have if I'm your main source of income what does that look like and so that we can look at building and forecasting for the future because their satisfaction is really important to me so now let me just and i i, I think that's a great question to ask but i also think a lot of times people or leaders or or in or those are un or un I don't know, unwilling, I'll say just say unwilling because I can't think of a better word, but hesitant, that's probably a better word to ask that question because now if they come back and say, hey, my goal is to have five X of what I'm getting paid now and I expect that over the next six months, you're going to say, that's just not really possible. And then they worry that, you know, once it's out there and you don't, and, and you say, hey, this is impossible, they're going to start looking for the door, looking for the exit, 
And now it's kind of in that, well, now if they're looking for the exit, do I want to keep them around because it's not going to be a long-term relationship? And so it's kind of like, you know, the uh, old attorney adage, never ask a question you don't already know the answer to. And yet that one's kind of opening it up for, I don't, you know, you don't always know the answer to it. So how do you balance that? It's a good question to ask and it helps to set it up for a good culture in the long run with also, hey, if I ask this and I get an answer I don't like and I like the employee and yet I'm not able to meet those expectations, it's now out there. So I know that was kind of a loaded question, but any thoughts on that? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I think that once again, this all comes back down to the level of transparency that you're comfortable with. So like, obviously, if you're not transparent at all about anything within your organization, then you ask a question like this, you are going to get responses that are going to be kind of blindsided. This has been built up from wanting to have people very heavily embedded with the financial health of the organization so that I don't know why I always I have this piece of me that I never want people to think I'm like hiding this hoard of cash like, oh, I'm driving my Tesla and having living the life and then you're making like what is comfortable and I'm taking advantage of that. And maybe that's because that's what we're seeing in some of the current events that people are thinking that things people are just hiding things. Um, and so basically these forecasting, they're then built into our financial goals. So like, if you want to see this happen, we have to see this many people, like this is what the workload looks like. Is that something that you want to be committed to? If the number is so outlandish, yes, it communicates to me that maybe they're not a great fit or maybe they're not going to be here. So I just had a team member who did give a number that I was like, you know, if you want this number, we're going to have to do these things. And she's like, I don't want to do those things. And I'm like, well, then what are you telling me? And she's like, well, I might be seeking other employment. And I was like, okay. And we're planning for that. So it's not like we're having her leave, but we're actively having transition conversations, which usually don't get that gift. Like usually they're just out and they're gone. Uh, Now we can actually talk about what does that look like from a support perspective when that role is empty? Because it's actually a quite significant role for me. Um, Mm. But it is, it's a different level of conversation. Like I'm, like I, like I said, like, and I have a small team, so I don't think that if you have a team of like a hundred, you should go in and start doing this, but it's interesting to watch there's just something to be said if we increase our vulnerability and transparency, not stupidly, because I know I'm talking to an attorney, so I'm sure that there's all kinds of, you could probably do a follow-up episode of like, here are the things I would say not to do as an added on bonus to what Sam is saying, but um, it is a balance, but we have to figure that out to bring the humanity back, which is causing people to re-engage in new ways. Because these conversations are risky, but I also have probably one of the most productive teams I've ever had, and they're part-time. Like, So I'm not paying full-time mm-hmm. salaries. Um, they're still comped at a nice hourly rate. Uh, and they're really happy with that. Like I have a 10 year employee that's been there for five years. And I always am like, is this valuable to you? And she's like, I love working here. Um, and then we're just kind of like a side gig. So uh, it's really interesting how that equation's kind of building and working. Mm, no, it makes perfect sense. So now one kind of follow up to that. And I think that it's, you know, more particular, it happens with all businesses, but probably happens more frequently with startups or small businesses, which is you may start out and have your idealized version of what the business might be or the setup might be and that you have those conversations. And then, you know, whether it's self discovery, hey, I set up the business thinking I was going to take it in this direction. I really don't want to do that direction anymore. And I want to go this way, or we need to adjust or shift, or we need to, Hey, I thought I wanted in full-time employees and I really want independent contractors or anything of that now. And so you've gone through, set up the expectations and everybody's working hard and things are going well. And yet you find that you want to make that shift either because you want to, or because it's what the business needs. How do you go about doing that or transitioning, you know, with the employees where you set up the culture and yet you realize for whatever reason you need to make a shift. Yeah. I think that it just comes with, you got to, you have to be prepared to tell the why behind it. You know, it's, it's one thing when you're just like, Oh, I read an article and 1099 employees sound great. So I'm just going to shift everybody. Um, versus like, and I, and I do think, and I know you and I chat about this in the early prep, you know, one of the things that I, 
I tried to avoid very early on was getting involved in the financials at the level that I am. And a lot of this culture building is directly tied to me being very into my financials. And like every week I spend at least probably an hour to two hours looking at them and playing with forecasting sheets and all that kind of stuff, uh, because that is a that's a sign of organizational health. And then looking at the culture, like it feeds the culture and those resources. Um, and so if we ever have to make a shift, um, the why should be very clear. And usually it's going to be a financial why of some sort. Like here are more resources I get to have if we can all shift people like this. And some people are going to get it and some people are not. And you have to be prepared to let go of those who are not. So I know like I've worked with family businesses who have someone who's a high producer who will never want to change on anything. And that halts the entire culture like they won't change anything because they got to keep that high producer but that's a choice that you make uh if that if the decision that you think is worth it in the long run it doesn't matter who comes and goes because they will all kind of set its stage up so you know in the world of entrepreneurship in particular risk you know generates the reward and you also usually have the ability to do those kinds of things but it you know i think the fact that you hesitate uh, is good because it makes sure that you take the time and do the proper planning and research so that you're not just making any like rash decisions. And if you do your research and your due diligence um, and you've done your hiring correctly, where you have built the culture that it's solid and everyone is there for the same kind of core purpose, they're mm -hmm. going to understand why the journey is adapting. So times when I've seen it blown up, it's when they don't know, like I, there was like a local a uh, holistic shop. She had converted everybody from 1099s to employees and she had very sound reasons to not share them. And everyone translated into it was greed uh, that mm -hmm. she wanted to have more control and things like that. And that was not the case at all. It was, uh, it was a matter of financial survival. Um, and like, yeah, I just, I think there's a lot of things that we assume we can't tell people. And if you would just tell them, it makes things a lot easier. Because if you don't tell them, they make up whatever is in that in-between kind of silence. So if you're if, if what you're going to tell them is worse than whatever they can make up, then yeah, hold it. But most of the times it's not. <laughs> you know, and I think that there's a, there's a lot of truth to that. And I, you know, it is it is scary as a as a leader, I think, you know, to have some of those conversations. It's kind of like, you know, when you're having to let someone go because it's, you know, not a good relationship or good setup. No, you know, everybody up from it has been let go, hates that conversation. But when you get into the the leadership, the boss position, you don't like that conversation any more than the person on the other side. And yes, it's maybe a little bit or easier in the sense that you're you're still gonna have that income, but it's certainly not a fun conversation. But you know, I think that it, it is hard. And sometimes it is, hey, I want to make more money and I, I started this business because I wanted more flexibility. I wanted to make more money. And this is what is best for the business that I founded. And it may not suit with everybody else. But I think that that yeah. level of transparency, while it can be uncomfortable on the, the short end, is going to be, I think, set it up so that people at least know. And so say, hey, I am I, I do want to make more money. Or, hey, we're not doing as well as we need to in order to have long-term viability. And this is what we're doing. Or we need more resources. So I think that, you know, yeah. kind of that, ongoing note is the more you can be transparent with the with the group that you're working on they're going to better understand because to your point most almost all the time people re, or when they don't know what's going on they always they're they always think of the worst case scenario and even yeah. so if, if it is a worst case scenario it's nothing worse than what they imagined and it can only get better from there if it's not the worst case scenario and so i i, I love that as a is a, a culture to set up and to hit that balance so yeah, we're, absolutely. We're already reaching towards the end of the the episode, and uh, it feels like you know uh, we there's a lot of things that uh, we could still hit on and have a great conversations on. So we'll have to maybe have you back on to uh, one of our uh, sister uh, podcasts again, and or sometime in the future, and continue on the conversation. Um, but at least for today, as we uh, wrap up this episode, um, if people want to. Uh, or sorry, before I get to how they reach out to you, I always at, or wrap up one que or wrap up with one question. So we'll jump to that now. So that question is: is within your industry, what is the biggest myth, and why is it wrong? Um, I would say that the biggest myth is that um, toxic workplaces come from a place of 
people wanting to do bad things to other people. In my experience, toxic workplaces are evolved out of ignoring habits and people like just trying to survive. It's basically survival mechanisms happening. So I guess I always just say that because sometimes we think we don't have a toxic workplace and you could be cultivating one without even knowing it because it's just kind of something that naturally kind of evolves. Makes uh, makes perfect sense. And I think that's a, a great uh, myth to dispel. So well, now as we uh, do wrap up the episode, if people want to reach out to you, they want to be a customer, they want to be a client, they want to be an employee, they want to be an investor, they want to be your next best friend, any or all of the above, what's the best way to reach out to you, contact you, find out more? The best way to get a hold of me is either visiting our website, which is hrartcenter.com. You can email me, Sam with two M's at hrart.com center.com or follow me on instagram because i like to hang out on instagram and it's sam smelter s-a-m-m and then smelter on the gram but those are the best ways oh i'm also hanging out on linkedin but i like the gram more i like the reels <laughs> awesome well i definitely encourage people to reach out connect make or support a great business if nothing else uh, make a new best friend so with that thank you again sam for coming on the podcast it's been a fun it's been a pleasure now for all of you the listeners that are out there if you have your own uh journey to share and you'd like to be a guest on the podcast we'd love to have you so let's go to inventiveguest.com apply to be on the show a couple more things as listeners if you can make sure to click share subscribe leave us a review helps us to reach even more startups and small businesses to help them along their journey to success and on that note if you ever need help with your startup your small business um <clears throat> With patents, trademarks, or anything else, uh, just uh, go to strategymeeting.com, grab some time with us to chat, and we're always here to help. Well, thank you again, Sam, for coming on the podcast, and wish the next leg of your journey even better than the last. Thank you so much.